researchers know that the pandemic has changed the economical and social environment throughout the world. The economy post-COVID comes hand in hand with a new way of looking about the future and doing business. Today, more than ever, entrepreneurship, innovation and international sustainable investment have a key role for the reactivation of local economies. Chile, as a platform for investment in Latin America, is committed to strengthening this path. We would like to welcome you and invite you to talk about and rethink the future of our country in this e-seminar Chile, redriving the investment and new opportunities of business organized by Invest Chile, the foreign investment promotion to support of the Ministry of Economics. Before starting, we would like to tell you, because of the times that we're going through, this is semin seminar is being performed with all the sanitary regulations advised by authorities. And also, we would like in Twitter using the hashtag InvestChile Seminar and become part of our dialogue. We are Chile. For us, each day is an adventure. The adventure of learning, the adventure of growing, of harnessing new talent. We are a young country, but one that has come a long way. It has not always been easy. Our character has been forged by challenges, and we're proud of what we have built together. You know us. You know what we're talking about. We're talking about confidence and the future we're building today. We're talking about strength, transparency, and a country with a vision of international integration with you as a partner, an ideal partnership for your project to thrive with talent, with creativity, with leadership. We are Chile, the platform in Latin America for global business. Let us make your next project happen. What would be better than to start with a guest that can give us some context for this conversation this morning? Because we have the Minister of Economy, Development and Tourism, Mr. Lucas Palacios. Thank you very much for all the attendees. This is a presentation that I would like to make because it's very important for us because it takes care of the way that we've been tackling the challenge of the pandemic that doesn't only mean a deep sanitary situation, but it's had an economic and social impact in our country. I would like to start by saying that, to give you some context, our country has had a GDP growth that's been very important since the 90s till now. We started in the 90s of 6.1% growth, and the last few years we've been growing 3.3%, but the per capita income has continued to grow very importantly throughout these years. The per capita GDP in our country com in compared values is $24,000 per person. That We are second behind Panama in the concept of Latin America. This comes from the IMF and the central bank of our country. What happened with the coronavirus? That's the evolution of what's been the active and the recovered people. We have a very low disease rate and we've managed to flatten the curve and that's thus managing the pandemic to be able to make this compatible with lowering the contagion, contention of the virus and reactivation of different economical sectors. There's a chart on the left lower side. You have a very strong impact of the pandemic from the labor point of view. We lost almost 2 million positions, but we've managed to recover almost 300,000 in the last few months. So we've been recovering the capability of generating job positions and activating our economy. We have a resilient economy. What we can see in the IMF predictions, you can see that Chile should drop their GDP on around 6%, and next year we should grow of 4.5%. And progressively, this 
figures have been improving. We can see that in Chile, maybe we could have a 5.5% drop and a growth of 5.5% next year. And we can also see that the investment has also increased in the projection for the next year. What has been the key to manage in a proper manner this COVID pandemic in our country? First, the chance, the opportunity of the response, not only the tools, but the timely response to implement, implement the measures. We implemented the first measures 16 days after the first case, which was in the first few days of March. If we compare that to the concept of the group of countries in Latin America and other countries in the world, you can, we can see that we have a ti had a timely response to tackle in a proper way since the beginning of this pandemic. And we have to say this, that Chile had a certain advantage compared to countries as, for instance, Europe or Italy, where the virus began earlier. That led us to prepare in hospital topics and the attention to more severe cases. And that has allowed us to tackle, not, not face the, the situation of only having one bed available, which we've been able that means that we've been able to take care of everyone that has been has needed it. If we see the magnitude of the response in this right chart, you have different countries, and the truth is that the percentage of the GDP, the response of our country has been a 9.7 percent. But if we compare it to the same measures in all every country, this gives Chile a 8.5, 8.4 percent of the GDP. That's below the line which means if we compare it to the other countries, and we see a response that's very important. I would like to say also that Chile has become a sort of, some sort of startup as government. We had to innovate in a series of measures that we had to approve through Congress for the approval and the Chamber of Representatives to take care of people. That's how we've created laws as the protection of jobs, the subsidies for most vulnerable people and other measures that we've implemented in over time to mitigate the social and economic impact of the pandemic. I would like to tell you that broadly the tools that we've implemented, we could divide them in two main plans. An emergency plan that was divided in three, the direct support for the income of families to come to offset the impact of lack of income because of loss of jobs, bon uh, bonuses, subsidies to reach informal sectors where we have less tools from the central government, the family emergency income that's ex been extended throughout time, and we have tax measures that support families and small businesses to delay the payment of certain taxes in benefit of the middle classes, uh, salary credits, and we have the protection of employment law to avoid that the loss of employment gets deeper and after the crisis those positions can be recovered without losing the situations of the employers employees that's been very important almost 700 mil 700,000 people adhere to this plan and we have a very important support for companies plan using different deals as credits subsidized credits with a very low interest rate and we have different measures for purchases from the state that we've been able to make the payment chain more agile using the for COVID for gap credits we've been able to incorporate almost 12 billion dollars to the economy which is very important the credits for companies grew in the crisis Normally, we res this is restricted in crises, but that allowed us to tackle and avoid the structural impact in multiple companies. And also, we have a second plan for the recovery with, for subs with subsidies to employment, and we need to encourage this reactivation. And that's what we've been doing for different economy industries. We have a very important public investment of $4.5 billion additional to what we had bud budgeted. That means that it would be a $34 billion invest dollar investment for investment, for concessions, for tax encouragement. And in Chile, private investment means represents 31, 81% of the total investment. 
That's why we would like to encourage private private investment and both national and international keeps generating strength in our country. We have another program for support for small businesses and tourism promotion that oh tourism is a very important industry in our country it generates 600,000 jobs a lot of female employment and it's one of the in industries that's been more impacted because of this pandemic and for we have prior, a, a law bill for to make the businesses don't go bankrupt. They have the legal and financial tools to avoid this. We have a model to make the lower costs more accessible, and we have working tables with different sectors in every region where we've been able to agree on specific measures for each sector and tax measures for companies to make this, the permit permit, uh, permit application more agile and we, these are 31 measures out of them we've implemented 20 to lower the bureaucracy times up to a 30 percent so that our country from now on is more digitalized for the effects of making the follow-up of the investment processes easier and thus triggering greater investment that we need for the future and from the point of view of foreign investment our country has always been a country that's interesting, where we attract a lot of foreign investment. If you can see the, the left chart, you see that Latin America and the Caribbean is a green line. And what our country shows is the red line that's well above since around the mid-80s, well above the international investment compared to other countries in Latin America. And actually, we had a drop, but you can see that it, we're going up again very strongly in the last few months, and we, there's a reactivation of an interest of foreign investment. And if you see the, the chart on the right, it's very important for us, this investment, because it has a direct relationship to the growth of the GDP, has a direct with investment, with the net creation of, of net capital. That's why it's very important for us to mitigate the structural impact in our economy that this pandemic had with things that we've been doing all this month with protocols, reactivating different industries. But the next stage is to give the, cur the correct encouragement to reactivate the investment from now till the next, with a projection for the next 50 years. And what we are doing from the Ministry of Economy, we have a series of measures, we have specific office that's called GPS that coordinates all the public institutions to make the investment process easier. We, uh, As I said, we have 31 measures that we've been working very strongly, and we have a platform that's called SUPER, which is a modified permit platform where you can flow, follow all the application for investment projects where you can identify the bottlenecks and clear them. I'm not talking about going over any regulation. It's very important that we respect the environment in the, in the future and we respect the part, citizen participation to insert them where we need to, where we need to insert the companies. That's the development that we want, want that they focus on people. And we don't want to dip in the bureaucracy. We want to make investment easier. We want to become a good partner for investment. Also, I want to remark that the last thing that you can see there, step by step Chile recovers. This is a program that we led from the Ministry of Economy to generate protocols in each one of the industries to have no sanitary risk and start and restart regular work. We've done this in the construction industry, with the tourism, with commerce, with mining. We work with the different ministries to enable these protocols, to apply them and to respect and to surveil. And this has allowed us to reactivate our economy. This is part of the step-by-step -step plan that's coordinated with the agile system for investment. Something that's very important that has caused some level of uncertainty is the constitutional process. I would like to say that many many countries deal with social situations where they demand to institutionally drive an assessment of the legal framework where 
you write the laws in countries. This is the Constitution, and I'm very proud to show that the process, the constitutional process, the social process in Chile was driven in a proper manner, using the institutional path. And we already started this process with the voting that had a lot of participation with the application of protocols with results that nobody questioned and that was celebrated by an important part of the country because we are starting a process to review the constitutions to see which will be the path that we will con follow from here to the future to become to continue being a competitive country a country where you have opportunities where you feel part of and that's very important because there are multiple elements within this framework where you create a new constitution there's very important topics that have to do with foreign investment for instance in in the main pillars of the constitution we have the respect of international treaties we have 29 international treaties commercial treaties with that means that we have treaties with 50 countries. We have a small country that's extraordinarily open for the world. More than 55% of the GDP has to do with international commerce. That's why our country will follow that path. Also, we have 38 agreements or treaties for promotion and protection of investment that are still current. That means that they meet multiple basic elements regulation about seizure of assets that means the respect for foreign investment and controversy resolution mechanisms that's very important and I would like to tell you that also within this framework of the constitutional discussion we have every international treaty that Chile has and among those we have some that are very important the Costa Rica treaty that Pact talks about human rights, but also talks and establishes that everyone has the, you, the right to use their assets and nobody can take them, except for with a just payment with, for social interests and everything following and respecting the law, that we respect private property. It's We are a country that maintains their commitment with this because it's part of a development model that has allowed us to grow very much in previous years and we want to protect to the future but using a more inclusive manner, maintaining the opportunities that we deserve in our country. But these are fundamental elements that will continue being defended and will be part of our judicial regulation because Chile is a country that respects international treaties and we've set this in the framework where we discuss the new constitution. We also have to remark the rest, international reciprocity that's incorporated in the free trade treaties in international law, respecting foreign investment and different areas like taxes, promotion and protection of foreign investment, controversy solution, etc. So I would like to say now uh, and give an optimistic view because our country for the last decades we've shown economical institution and political stability and that's the way that we solve our conflicts and we've had as many countries we have situations work with conflicts and problems that we need to tackle following all the regulations and institutionality gives us and that's how we are dealing with the pandemic and that's how we are improving our economy and that's how we are recovering the jobs and that's the same way that we want to encourage foreign investment from here to the future. Thank you very much, Minister. Before we continue, Josefa has something very important to say. Connecting with the interests of foreign investors, with the opportunities, the business opportunities that Chile has to offer, that is the main task of Invest Chile, the agency for the promotion of foreign investment. Each year, Invest Chile helps more than 700 foreign companies with services that have led it to be quite recognized for two consecutive years as the best agency in South America by a specialized magazine from the U.S. site selection. Do you want to know a bit more about Investile? Please uh, follow the following.
continue with Invest Chile working on the e-seminar Chile drives investment and new business opportunities. Our next guest has a lot to say, especially about what has to do with the new scenario and new opportunities that the post-pandemic Chile has to offer. Okay, here in the study we have Juan Araya Rende, the Deputy Director of Investment Chile. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Yes, good morning. The first question, what is the impact of the pandemic and foreign investment at a global level and at a Chilean level? The pandemic, yes, of course, it has had a great uh, impact at uh, foreign investment level in the entire world. If you look at the dates, March, April, approximately the United Nations did estimations of how much the impact was going to be of COVID-19 in terms of foreign investment and its estimations were, were between 35 and 50 percent and for the region they were talking about even 60 percent in the in the decrease of the investment rates the first uh, semester this fall was at a 50 percent at a global level in oecd countries it was even 77 percent that is the extent of what we're currently facing in terms of the fall on foreign investment. In the case of Chile, in the first semester, our numbers were quite good, great. We had an uh, exceed in terms of foreign investment. But uh, with the rates of September this year, they show a fall of around 15%, a downward trend in terms of uh, foreign investment. Therefore, yes, it has to do with the region, the, the planet, but it's a bit, yes, we see a downward trend that is is uh, quite normal. Now, a couple of things that are important. In the last two years, Chile has shown a significant recovery in numbers in terms of foreign investment. And in 2019, we had 63% investment uh, over 2018. Even with this downwards trend, we're over the uh, the average of the last quinquina in, the last, in, in Chile. And uh, it is also worth noting that foreign investment is uh, medium and long-term investment. No one may makes that decision for tomorrow, it's uh, for now. Yes, the investment we have in Chile is not in portfolio, it's not going to the stock and it's good, they invest and it goes out, but it's investment in industry and it produces employment. What are the mechanisms that are important in this scenario? Not only Chile is, co is uh, complicated, but the region is also uh, with issues. What is Invest Chile doing now to bring this foreign investment in these complex moments in the pandemic? We focus on three main uh, elements. The first one is to work on retaining and materializing projects that were in process of investment in Chile, where projects are not stopped because of the pandemic and the restrictions, and for the investments that were in Chile to maintain their operations, and that is basically through providing much information about what the government does. The second pillar is robust work in sectors where we do have a potential to continue working with those potential investors that look at Chile and medium and long-term processes. And the third pillar is a robust and solid work with some ministries to help them with their portfolios. We've worked strongly with the Ministry of Energy that is uh, working on green hydrogen. We've been supporting them in seminars in China and Japan to show the potential of Chile, disseminate it, and to connect it with potential investors. Investors that look from the outside, from abroad, they look at many countries, for example, and they look at Latin America. Why should they notice Chile for their projects to be innovative, sustainable? Why? What, what's the attractive of Chile that differentiates us uh, regarding other countries? But we as an agency, since we're a small organization, we have to be much more dynamic and go beyond the sectors. And we try to identify potential for investment in non-revealed sectors where we have advantages that are not that obvious. And we made great efforts there. We have two important matters. The first one is that we have a great potential for the production of clean energies. And the second one is that we have enormous potential in terms of innovation. Clearly, Chile is not a country with a large population. We cannot focus on industries that are intensive in terms of labor. Therefore, we believe we have a great potential in sectors where we can seize the great quality of our education that is recognized at an international level. We have certain potentials of niches that are not that labor intensive, but they do have a good quality uh, work at a technical level. 
So those are the great advantages. And likewise, in the last years, Chile has identified the sector of global services where we're working on in terms of food and agricultural matters, of food tech, agrotech, which are new applications or technologies applied to the world of food and agro, agriculture, and uh, global services. Chile has become the regional center for the installation of data centers, the most important investors globally now in, in technological matters. We're talking about Microsoft, Huawei, Google, web service. They're not only looking at Chile, observing Chile, but they have established their data centers in Chile. Therefore, that shows you the potential that we have to continue developing in this industry. One last point. What are the challenges that will show up for attracting for direct foreign investment in Chile in the next year to come? The word is a mantra, reactivation. It becomes a mantra, reactivation, reactivation, reactivation. The countries that first recover post-pandemic will have an advantage. We're working strongly on how we can be a lever for this purpose. We need to close certain gaps. We're working strongly on this, on the negotiation of projects to be more efficient and for us to reduce our time. That is very important because at the end of the day, that will allow attract more investment. And when we talk about foreign investment, we're not talking about more resources entering the country, but we're talking about what foreign investment means for, for Chile. It means more and better jobs. It means an entire virtuous circle that is generated in the investment around a series of SMEs that provide services for these companies. Therefore, that is the impact that foreign investment has at the end of the day, that we're able to generate more jobs, more growth. Juana Vallaven, the Deputy Director of Invest Chile, would like to thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you very much. And to all of you, we will go to a brief pause. And when we come back, we have many more matters to talk about. For example, We'll talk with companies that are investing in our country. We'd we'll also talk with the distinguished economist Jeffrey Sachs. And you can comment through Twitter with hashtag InvestChile Seminar. Please do not go away, and we'll see each other soon. Continue now because in the last few years Chile has positioned itself as a digital hub in Latin America with the installation of more than 15 data centers of companies at a global level. Invest Chile has supported more than 20 new projects of the area sector with a potential investment of three billion dollars. And what makes our country so attractive in this area for infrastructure and technological companies? This is part of what we will talk about with our next guest. He is Felipe Caballero, under president, vice president of construction engineering of the Brazilian company Ascenti that has two data centers in Chile and that's in, in an expansion project. Good morning, Felipe. How are you? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to talk about our history in Chile. Recently, we had news about the project of installing new data centers. How do you see that project, that process? Well, we couldn't talk about an expansion for a new data center without talking, without first saying about this, what's happening in installing our first data center in Chile. We started last year. We we got into record time, uh, instead of all the moment uh, that we are going through, to deliver to the customer. Today, November 11th, we are commissioning 6.3 megawatts of power for IT, being a total of 11 megawatts of total power. And obviously, 
This made that our customer, this cost our customer to understand that we have the possibility of working with Ascenti again, as they do in other countries, uh, for instance, Brazil, Mexico, and others, to bet on coming to Chile with Ascenti. And this, this is what drove this new expansion in Chile, where we'll, we'll have a data center that's three times bigger where we're talking about an IT power of around 20 megawatts with a total power of 30, 32 megawatts. So we are talking, that, because the, the question is obvious, what motivated you to keep growing in a country that has been very affected? It's a, a problem of the region and our country. What, what motivated to keep in, investing and growing in Chile? Well, for us, it's very important once we prove Chile as a strategic point because of the good conditions as a location, connectivity, abundance of energy, of power, an active economy and receptive economy that simplifies the investments. So the conditions so that we can land in Chile very easily with a very low bureaucracy. This is not only noted by Ascenti, but our global customers that, that need the same conditions to install their data centers with edge, cutting edge technology and new technologies that are being developed. So I think that that's the focus point to land at a country that gives us the conditions so that we can keep investing instead of a, of the problems that we've had this year, obviously, but our moments that or instances that are outside of our control. But investing in Chile has been very easy for us and to be able to expand it, not only to a second data center, but I would like to tell you that we will have the third one. And for you, Chile, is a digital hub in Latin America? Yes, for us, it's very important. But Chile is very important from the strategic point of view because we are at a location, a privileged location, safe location, with connectivity, with, as I was saying, clean, renewable energy, and our goal will always be to be able to have Chile as a hub for our data centers, because from there to the world, to our customers, can also have the intention to work. So when we installed ourselves in Chile, we don't only get there looking for a new business just to take care of the needs of our global customers that want to start working in Chile and from Chile be able to work for the world. So very interesting, Felipe Caballero, Vice President of Project Engineering and Construction of Ascenti. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And if talking about extraordinary cases, hear this correctly. Chile can be the protagonist of a true global revolution in energy terms because, according to specialists, our country gathers the ideal conditions to produce green hydrogen, which for many is the fuel of the future. Are we ready to be pioneers and lead this revolution? To respond to this question, we have here with us Nier Grovet, who is the leader of business for multinational NG, French multinational. Welcome, Niels. Thank you, Josefa, for the invitation. No, thank you. The truth is that we're talking about sustainable renewable energies, but we're talking about green hydrogen as well, which I believe is a concept that has positioned itself slowly. What is it and why does Chile gather the conditions to have a good business here? Chile has 
of course, some critical elements for the production of green hydrogen. Chile in the north and the south of Chile, the territory, we can strengthen the production of renewable energy there because to produce green hydrogen, we need a source of renewable energy. But in addition, we have to have an entire ecosystem, not only have access to renewable energy, but to also have some potential consumers, such as the territory of the north of Chile with the mining and some chemical companies that have um, the need of decarbonizing and the use of hydrogen to add to renewable energy that could be a solution for the carbon footprint of these companies. Neil, you are present in Brazil, Peru, Argentina, and Chile. You've had, you've been through here in Mejillones with the regas plant, with the hydropower plants. But in 2018, you started strengthening this business of green hydrogen. Now the question is, what are the plans of your company to develop this company in Chile, this industry? Well, first of all, we have created two years ago a business unit that is specially dedicated to the development of renewable hydrogen. And we have assessed different uh, parts in the world, territories, to assess this. these types of projects are large scale. And Chile, at the, in the ranking of countries, it's interesting because Chile was one of the number one in our ranking. Why? Because, first of all, as we talked about before, it has these uh, elements, and we've seen this potential with some customers of our customers that we have in the north of Chile. Therefore, NG, as an international company, has decided to develop different projects in this area, the north of Chile, where we have, for now, a pipeline uh, of projects that is under development that in the in this uh, decade will probably need investment large amounts of investments for hydrogen producing plants at large scale we're talking about more than two three thousand three billion dollars that will be injected here in Chile throughout the years or these two decades to come. Let's talk about benefits. What are the final benefits of having a uh, an energy network here, specifically in terms of uh, green hydrogen? If we want to decarbonize a process that is industrial, mobility, and others, we have different ways of doing so. Or through electricity, because there's many uses that currently need electricity, but there are some things, some processes, some sectors which decarbonization cannot be done through electricity. So in this case, uh, diesel uh, fuels, dual fuel, all of this energy demand that cannot be supplied through electricity. For this, we need another renewable element, and that is where the hydrogen solution comes in. Well, this hydrogen, hydrogen can be substituted by these, uh, can substitute these fuels that are hard to decarbonize. Neil, I was also reading that you can use this at any time of the day, at night, or under any weather condition. What are the conditions that our country gathers to make this type of uh, energy feasible at a long term? As you mentioned, it is one of the advantages of hydrogen, actually. You can use it during the day and clearly 
in the north of Chile. We have an enormous potential there to produce hydrogen thanks to the solar resources. The advantage is that we're transforming solar energy, which only exists during the day, into something that can be reused during the night. Now, once solar power turns into hydrogen energy, hydrogen can be stored and can be used outside the area which allows you to have an abundance of renewable energy and during the day and during the, the night. But in that regard, I'd like to know what are the sectors or industries that could be benefited by using these types of energies? There are many sectors that could reap the benefits of this locally, domestically. Domestic use is that we could have uh, the mining industry here in Chile. Uh, it is an engine for economy, clearly. So we could have a decarbonization of mining through this renewable initiative directly through electricity or hydrogen, which could be a first domestic application. Then we have all the possibilities of transforming this hydrogen into different products, such as ammonia, methanol, and other types of fuels which can be exported. And there's no limit there because the maritime sector has to decarbonize all transport through the ships. So transports of uh, large tonnage, which are complicated nowadays, we could do all of this through hydrogen and hydrogen der uh, derivatives. And uh, for example, in the mining sector, the mining trucks, that you can have an application there in Chile or in other countries that don't have uh, as much renewable energy as Chile has. Perfect. That is uh, quite interesting what you've told us. This is a space where Chile is also progressing and growing. Niels uh, Grovet, thank you very much for accompanying us today, head of the development of green hydrogen for company Engie. Thank you very much for accompanying us today. And when we return, we will be talking with the remarked North American economist Jeffrey Sachs about the global post-pandemic economic situation. And don't forget to comment using social media, using Twitter in our seminar, hashtag InvestChile Seminar, and become part of our dialogue. A pause and we will return. The World Economic Overview, the, it's uncertain in the role of pandemic. What's, what will be the role of the pandemic in economies such as the Chilean economy after the crisis? And in addition, our, our next interview is with one of the most uh, important economists from the world, academic at the University of Columbia, senior advisor of the United Nations, and has been named within the 100 more influential leaders in the world by magazine Time. We'd like to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Mr. Sachs, thank you so much to being here. We are very grateful to talk with you today. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. And we have some questions for you. 2020 Please. has certainly been a complex year on several fronts. The pandemic, the trade war, the U.S. elections. What can we expect about the future of global economy? I think we can expect a better year in 2021 uh, on, on all fronts. Uh, we should be in a much better shape to get this pandemic under control. Uh, countries are learning better how to take control measures. We will have some new vaccines coming in 2021. So that will be a, a big improvement. Second, uh, we have a big improvement in the United States. Uh, we will have a new president on January 20th, uh, President uh, Joe Biden, and uh, he's going to be a far better president. He will stop these trade wars uh, and he will restart global cooperation. 
We will also have a number of important meetings internationally, including uh, the meeting on climate change, in which I think almost all countries of the world will make a clear commitment to reach net zero emissions of carbon dioxide by 2050. So on all fronts, I think we will be in a better position in 2021 than we are this absolutely uh, horrible year. Yeah, I know. So how do you see economic recovery in the region and in Chile in particular? Will it take time? Well, clearly uh, the, the first condition for recovery is to get the pandemic under control. And I would say that uh, all of the region of the Americas, uh, my country, Uh, and all through Latin America have not had a, a great experience this year. Uh, I would say we should compare our performance with the countries of the Asia Pacific region, like China, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, all of them have stopped the pandemic. So the first thing I would say to everybody is look at the experience in Asia and then ask, what are we doing wrong and what do we need to do better? Better public health measures, better testing and tracing, but this epidemic can be controlled. And this is the first point for the economy is stop this rampant uh, epidemic. Uh, of course, prepare for using the vaccines, which will be coming in 2021 as well then I think it's important to have a clear recovery program. And that should be built on investing in the new clean economy. I'm glad that Chile has made a clear commitment now to clean energy because Chile has so much potential of solar power, uh, also uh, hydroelectric, tremendous uh, opportunities for clean electricity, which Chile needs for all its industry. Uh, and, and for uh, all its uh, power use in general. So that's a second point. Uh, then I think uh, it will be helpful, and it's been very difficult this year, of course, to have more regional cooperation uh, in South America, even for the power supply system. Yes. Unfortunately, and some of the governments are not so cooperative. So this is a, really a question of whether we can find the cooperation needed. Yeah, in fact, will the global crisis caused by the pandemic affect levels of sustainable investment given the present need for economy recovery? Well, the, the good news on investment is that interest rates are extremely low uh, and so financing terms can be very, very favorable for good projects. And if we reduce uncertainties and have decent cooperation internationally, and with Trump gone, that will be much easier to do. Then I think it's possible to have the kind of investment-led recovery that we need. Uh, the recovery won't be led by consumption. The recovery will be led by public investment. Uh, but I think that there is a real prospect for this. Interest rates are low. Uh, renewable energy costs have plummeted the ability to make large-scale investments uh, in solar energy, for example, in Chile will be very good. I think Chile's markets internationally for copper, uh, for uh, agricultural products will be strong. There is a strong recovery underway in Asia. This is a natural market for Chile. Yeah. Uh, keep good relations with China, Japan, Korea. They are your big market. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, th this is an important point that they are in recovery now. And therefore, uh, the market <coughs> looks uh, pretty good and the ability to therefore mobilize investments looks quite good. Okay. And um, how would increase green investment could benefit Chile's economic and social development? Well, the green investments, first of all, are, are very cost effective now. The price of uh, solar energy has come down so much that it is absolutely cost competitive with every other source. 
And from a national security point of view, it's good. Chile has the sunshine. It doesn't have to import uh, oil and gas uh, from any place else. Uh, this is uh, straight out of the Atacama Desert. Uh, and uh, you've got the best resources in the world for solar energy. So the costs work, the national security works. It's cleaner air uh, because this is a non-polluting energy source. Uh, it is a part of the sustainable development chain for all value uh, products right now. Everybody in the world wants to know, are the companies on a sustainable supply chain? And so with clean energy, this is going to be another selling point for Chile, another attractive point. Yeah. So I, I see everything going in the right direction. Okay, and what can Chile do to attract companies that are truly committed to making sustainable investment? Well, it, clearly, uh, first is a national plan that uh, shows this is the direction that uh, Chile is going. Here are our resources. This is the framework in which investments can be made. So the legal structure, the clear plan, the clear commitment to reach net zero emissions, the fact uh, that other public investments, uh, for example, getting ready for electric vehicles, which will be a major transformation of uh, uh, mobility uh, everywhere in the world in the next 15 years, is another thing that the government can do. Uh, yet another point, of course, for investment in general is to say we have the skills uh, in order to be uh, the, the right place to do business. The skills uh, in the 21st century, of course, are uh, the kind of technical skills that uh, require solid education. And so I think that uh, any country, and Chile is in a good position to do it, that wants to promote a, a clean, green, uh, vibrant future needs to focus as well on more inclusive, high quality education. This has been a, a big point of yes. debate in Chile for years, but I think that the commitment of the public budget and public policy to universal access to quality education has to be a priority for Chile going forward. Another question, Mr. Sachs, you were talking about this. Our country is seeking to decarbonize its economy, given priority to other product production of clean energies, such as wind and solar power and green hydrogen. What benefits can Chilean society expect from this change? Well, first of all, we all have to do it everywhere in the world uh, because uh, we are uh, in a climate crisis that is getting more and more uh, dire, more and more serious. 2020, uh, our year is not only a year of pandemic, but it's probably going to be the hottest year uh, in history or certainly in the top uh, few years of recorded history in temperature. In other words, we have a massive crisis, so every country has to decarbonize. We just had a presidential election where this was debated, uh, where Trump wants to protect the fossil fuel industry. Biden says, no, we're going to uh, have a clean economy, and Biden won the election. Uh, and it's also important for people in Chile to appreciate that just in recent weeks, uh, China has committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2060 in China's case. Japan uh, has just committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Korea has just committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Europe has uh, also uh, adopted the European Green Deal, which commits to net zero emissions by 2050. And Europe is also going to put in place border taxes uh, to uh, put tariffs on products that are produced with uh, carbon intensive fossil fuel energy. So it's going to be a, a trade barrier for countries that continue to rely on fossil fuels. Uh, all of this means that Chile will be part of a world effort, but Chile has a big advantage 
which is it has maybe the best solar power in the entire world uh, available to it. Uh, and this is extremely important. They're totally. wonderful yeah. investment opportunities in Chile. Absolutely. There has been important green investment in Chile, in Chilean energy sector. So how can this progress be broadened to other economic sectors? Well, we're going to need green energy uh, for the mining sector, obviously. That's where uh, some of this investment has started. For the transport sector, because we'll be driving electric vehicles. For the buildings sector, because our buildings will become all electric buildings. And for some heavy industry, the uh, clean energy is going to be used also with so-called green chemistry to produce hydrogen or other synthetic fuels that also will be uh, important for decarbonization. In other words, you use the uh, clean electricity to make uh, split water to make hydrogen, uh, or you use it to make uh, green methane, synthetic methane, or uh, other uh, kinds of products, even uh, hydrocarbon liquids that are made synthetically rather than through oil and gas extraction. So Chile may also develop an industry based on solar that is not for direct electrification, but for a hydrogen economy, for example, which could be important for Chile's own industry or even for export. So there are lots of opportunities to explore. But the point is that uh, this kind of zero carbon energy will be the infrastructure basis for the entire economy, not for a single sector. And finally, I suppose you know, our country is in the process of drafting a new constitution. So, what are the main points it should include as regards sustainable development? Well, uh, this is a, a good opportunity to enshrine sustainable development in the constitution. Sustainable development means uh, that there is at the, at the base uh, a commitment to social inclusion based on human dignity. Uh, this is uh, the idea of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as environmental sustainability. Uh, and constitutions around the world, the modern ones, uh, have put in the environmental sustainability as a constitutional protection. Uh, and it can play a role in helping to guide the process. But I think for Chile, uh, Chile has many, many strengths, of course. Uh, and it has been uh, a, an economy of success. Uh, it has been a place uh, where one can make uh, good investments uh, and where there has been economic growth. But we know that Chile faces the challenges of social inclusion. Uh, inequality has come down a bit from the very highest levels, but it's still quite high. And we know that Chile, like all countries, is part of this transformation to environmental sustainability. So I hope that the constitutional process reflects Chile's ongoing strengths of a mixed market economy uh, and <clears throat> all that that promises together with the commitment to social inclusion, leaving no one behind, ensuring that basic human needs are met, and ensuring the good stewardship of the environment through the commitment to sustainability. Absolutely. Mr. Sachs, thank you so much for this interview and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Thanks for having me with you. <laughs> Yes. Definitely an important look from this economist. Jeffrey Sachs has joined us in this Invest Chile seminar. And now we'll leave you with the next message. That's it, because I wanted to tell you that Invest Chile, the promotion agency of foreign investment, advises com inter foreign companies so that they can start operations in the country. This year is supporting projects for more than $18 billion. And what's even more important, with the potential of job creation of 18,000 positions. To know more about Invest Chile, I would like to invite you to watch the following ad.
The recovery of the work as the jobs is one of the main challenges that our country is facing in the post-pandemic economy, in a context where, where traditional sectors don't seem to offer new answers to the growing need of working positions, the digital sector has a good health and needs trained workers. How to enter an area that seems to work even in this crisis? The ones that want to reinvent themselves, they should do it because this is a wide world. Things have changed and everything is centered in technology and in creating new digital platforms. I studied engineering. I worked four years on that. And because of the changes in the country, I quit that industry and study programming. To reinvent yourself, to learn new skills in short time, to adapt to this changing world, this is the path that Janina Leslie and 900 other graduated students from the program Digital Talent have taken to get better work prospects and better self-realization. Now, through this initiative, Job Talent, 900 students that are programmers will have opportunities to be in touch with more than 100 companies, national and international, that are looking for new digital talent. The first in a space of two days that is composed on one side by a talk and workshop program that are available for all our graduated students. And this is the space where we want to gather the companies with our students. And technology change all the time, the productive processes also. Therefore, the worker has to be trained all the time. Likewise, the world is changing at all times. Companies are also doing so. And the drive of this change are people. Walmart today, it is undergoing the biggest transformation of its story. We are creating an ecosystem of digital products and we need people to work in a collaborative way. They need to think beyond. We are really interested in getting to know this talent so we can add it to our team. And space to gather the new generation of digital talent with the companies that need that talent. That is Job Talent, a joint initiative between digital talent and Invest Chile. And as we saw in this play, the fair, the fair for capital, uh, human capital and job talent is a new event driven by digital talent and Invest Chile, where national and international companies seek for young talent. That's very important in the encoding field and the technological sector in general. To talk about this topic, we have Vladimir Glasinovich the executive director of Digital Talent for Chile from the Chile Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us today. First of all, I will ask the necessary question. What is digital talent? What do we, what are we talking about when we say, talk about this, looking for young talent this way? Thank you very much for the invitation, Josefa. Well, digital talent for Chile, our purpose is to humanize the digital transformation. What we look for is that this global phenomenon of digital transformation that's associated to threat, to loss of jobs, is a synonym of opportunities of improving the jobs, improving wages, and indefinite, definitely improving the, the quality of life. That's what we do in digital talent. And we do this using short training, short courses, between three to five months long, using the bootcamp methodology, which is a very extensive the bootcamp means this military training, military camps that the pe people are all day training that maybe they didn't know anything about technology or coding and they finish this course coding and they can start working in a technological area with good wage, good stability and they can improve their quality of life. And in that sense, what's the importance of this fair, not only for people that attend it, but for companies that participate? It's very important. First of all, uh, some uh, some fact from the market. Every day in Chile, we have a deficit of around 5,000 digital talents. We have positions open for, uh, in the technological area, and 5,000 positions are not filled. That's a huge loss of w working positions. People need to improve their, their technological development. And what we do in this fair in 
this alliance with Invest Chile is that we will join our first 1,000 promoted from digital talent with Chilean and international companies that need new and young digital talent that want to start working in the. Is it a profile, specific profile of between certain age to certain age? Do young people have easier have it easier to learn, or can it be beyond this age group? That, of course, we know that it will be easier for them. It's very interesting what you're asking. These trainings are open for people from all age groups, but applicants are mostly, about 60% are between 25 and 35 years old. And it's very curious that 70% have some experience in higher education. Maybe that they finished their university or a technical, a technical, a technical institute or some people that dropped out before me because of a economical reason or by any other reason didn't find their their vocation and they get this digital talent opportunity as a second opportunity for people that didn't find their, their opportunity in the first approach to the traditional educational system bootcamp offers this second opportunity second chance vladimir thank you very much for being with us today and for those that are interested i will give you this information and Enter your information in the platform of Labor Fairs, clicking the banner in the lower part of the screen. I would like to remember, remind you that you can follow us using the hashtag InvestChiles eSeminar and become part of our dialogue. And please stay with us because we will continue talking about this. We will have panels, conversation panels, and we have the view of an expert about the labor challenges that come from this new context. We will continue after this. Sorry, Josefa, we'll now connect with Mexico to talk with Leticia Gasca to know her vision. She is a co-chair of the board, a director board of education and employment of the Community of Global Shapers of the World Economic Forum. How do we prepare for this new evolution of uh, labor at a global level? These are the strategies to prepare for the new economic and labor environment from the vision of an expert. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where are you getting the connection from. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation and to consider me to talk about this topic that is really passionate for me, where the labor market is going and how can we get prepared. To start, this is important because adults spend one third of our lives working, and this is an activity that we dedicate so much time, and we are evolving so fast because of the technology and other powerful, powerful forces that we are going to describe now. So if you are interested to know where the work labor uh, market is going, you are in the right place. Let's start talking about where we are standing. We are in this very interesting historical period that is the fourth industrial revolution that it is based upon the other three revolutions, the first one the steam revolution. The second one was related to electricity that brought to our lives telephone and bulb. The third revolution, it is the computing one, cell phones. And the fourth one, industrial revolution, it is the one called the artificial intelligence technology revolution. But I have to clear up that there are other forces that are involved in this fourth revolution, that it is because the speed of the change it is faster than the three previous revolutions. We are in a, at a historical moment of a great change. And this is happening because of the artificial intelligence, technology. However, it's important that 
is not only the technology the one that it is setting the pace of this change. There are other forces that are important that have incidence in the way we work or study. For example, in climate change, we have 10 years to reduce the contaminant emissions. Otherwise, this is going to have no turn back. Other force that it is shaping our the way we work, it is the migration. We have more migration than ever before. If we don't contain the challenges of the climate change, we are going to see migrant related to climate. The other factor is the aging of the population in many places in Latin America, where we used to say that we have a population bonus with a great amount of young people. In the next uh, decades, we are going to stop having that benefits, and we are going to see more elderly people and aging people that they live more also, almost 100 years. We have to rethink the pension system, the retirement system, and what it means to be in the workplace, uh, people from different ages sharing. Another force also that it is changing the work we work, it is the pandemic. If you have been here in the planet Earth in the last months, you see that COVID has changed the way in which we work, and many of those changes are here to stay. In fact, one topic that or that term that is popular in the last months, it is that the world is very bouquet. It means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and also we have to add the factor of technology. It is interesting that this bouquet term, it was invented at the end of the 80s because of the military strategists to define the way in which they perceive the world in that moment in the 80s. Clearly, since then to now, the world continues to be really bouquet, and every time even more. The great challenge it is to how to know how to adapt. How do we take this advantage? And there is about this volatility and changing world. How do we prepare for this fourth industrial revolution? And in the next minutes, I want to share with you some very, very good strategies for the organizational level for this fourth industrial revolution. And I call these the four keys for success. First, to learn to learn, to develop critical thinking, to make better decisions, and to embrace the change, adaptability, and resilience, and to have a data mentality, take advantage of the technology we have. And in this way, we can create situations for the future to be better prepared. Let's start with one of the most important abilities that everyone has to develop, learn to learn to everyone calls this learnability. And this is fundamental because if we are in a world that is changing all the time, technology is changing all the time, and the lifespan or the average lifespan of an ability or a skill is five years, this means that all the time that we have to be learning. And the rule in English, it is lifelong learning, continuous education. And this is fundamental because the knowledge is power. So learn to learn is a superpower. Probably some people that are listening to me right now, they would be thinking, well, I'm so old to continue all learning and to go back to school and learn new skills. But let me tell you that neuroscience and experience show us that this is not true. There is no limit for learning. It doesn't matter the age you have. We always can learn new things. And to prove it, I want to tell you a story. This is the story of the DJ, the old older DJ, oldest DJ in the world. Actually, it is a woman. It is a Sumirak DJ. She is a grandmother, Japanese, and that plays house music. It's the biggest one in her area. And the fascinating thing about her story is that she was in the school of DJs for the first time without knowing anything about music when she was 70 years old. And when she was asked about how did you do it to acquire this new radical ability at 70 years old, and her answer 
answer enlighten us about what we have to do to learn better. She says, I learned music at 70 years old because I went to that DJ school, not thinking about learning music. I was thinking that I wanted to play with music. And that ludic way or playful way is something that helped adults to learn better. So if you are not learning something new today, please, the, your homework it is to think about what is the next ability that you want to acquire or what do you want to update or start from zero. And one important strategy to be prepared for the fourth industrial revolution it is to develop critical thinking and problem solving. This is nothing new. It is a skill that has been with us alongside the history of the humanity. The legend says that Alejandro Magnum, Alexander Magnum was a student of Socrates. And this is really interesting because um, the teacher was asked at some point, what are you teaching him? He is Magnum. So what are you teaching him? Philosophy, medicine, mathematics, politics. And he said, I am teaching him the most important ability that a king should have, that it is to think in a critical way. Since then to now, we have created a thousand methodologies for critical thinking, and I think that everything is useful, important, but we have to acknowledge this skill and how important it is and to do something to acquire it. Online courses, books, and many times what we need is just to to have a methodology to help us to make better decisions. So I invite you to go and take the first step. Remember that the critical thinking is one of the most important skills for the future of work, not only because we are exposed to a great amount of information, but most of all, in pandemic times, everything is more complex. And the best time and the best way to decide it is with critical thinking. Other very important skill adaptability and agility to change. I, in fact, wrote a book about this, Cambia Todo is the name, and this is a topic that is particularly important in this time that we are going through, because what has, has happened it is that the pandemic has taken us all out of our comfort zone. Some people stayed in the, in the area of being afraid and scared, others have learned and as others have taken advantage of this uncomfortability that the pandemic generates, and you can be successful or a failure. And it's important to acknowledge that to get to this zone and to learn to get out of your comfort zone and to capitalize that uncomfortability, we have to build resilience. And I put this image here because it's the best way to explain what it is resilience and how you acquire it. We have to go to the origin of the word. Resilience is the word that it is very popular the last time that originally we took it from science. It's a property of any object, a spring in this case, to be expanded and then coming back to the original position or shape. In our case, it is to come back to our center after something happens that takes us out of it. First, we have to have a growth mentality, a growth mentality. And actually, there is a book about it. That I recommend this book to you. It is Growth Mindset. And it talks about what do we have to have as this mentality. And this is the difference between being successful in your life or not. This growing mentality or growth mindset, we always can learn some new things that are no determined levels of intelligence and we can always can be more clever and learn new things and we have to embrace this uh, feedback and also to create this resilience we have to accept the change we don't have to fight it it's useless we have to accept it and we have to create networks this is a little bit like a time of walker in the circus i love that picture that you are seeing imagine that you are in the circus and you see a tightrope walker making some equilibrium and balance on the 
they will tie up, but they are trusting that they have a network of security if he or she falls, this consequence is not going to be fatal. In the case of human beings, this is actually very similar. We need to create networks of support, people that are, are going to be there in case that anything goes wrong. So I invite you to create networks. And the fourth strategy that is fundamental for the future of the work it is to have data mentality. And with this, I don't say, I don't mean that everyone has to be a data scientist or analyst, analyst, professionally speaking. It is just to understand the potential that it is on data and to take advantage of the productive analytics that help us to project this into the future. I can talk to you about a very close uh, example that I have in my company. This is a company that offers predictive analytics to help governments and companies to understand the new technologies and to know how the new technology is going to affect the workforce and how uh, they can retrain these people efficiently to have viable employment in the future, less risky in this world full of robotics and automatization and also is going to help us what is the future in terms of employment in my industry or my city please embrace tools like Fatima and others in the market as well to be prepared for the future using data. We have to be well informed with data and evidence. This is important. And also, COVID has accelerated the change. As a few months ago, we published in the MT Technology Review a paper about how COVID has accelerated the change to robotic and automatization technology, and how can we adapt to this. And if you want to go deeper on this topic, send me an email, I will be pleased to share this paper or any other information that we have discussed so far. I think that my time is almost over. That's why I would like to leave you with the last message, some food for thought. First, the world is changing faster than ever. Everything is changing. Embrace the change. And there are strategies that could help us to take advantage of this transformation. Second message. Everyone had insight a Sumer Rock DJ. I can assure you that if you dedicate enough time and energy, you can learn anything. There is no limit. And I invite you that today, after this event, or maybe tomorrow, you can give the or start the walking in that direction for a new ability or skill. You are not going to regret it. And this work and this path to work, to be ready for the work of the future, it is similar to athleticism because if we want want to get fast there, we can be alone. But if we want to get further, we have to go with company. I congratulate you because I think in this, in this event, in this seminar, you are in good company. This is the proof to be ready for change and for the future and beyond preparing, we can shape the future and to determine how is it going to be our future in the work market. Thank you for your time and I'm talking totally open and to questions and comments. Uh, you can be uh, also in contact with me through my email. A first question, Leticia. What are the skills that companies will seek after this pandemic? This the most important question that we have to ask ourselves now. Among the important skills are first, critical thinking and problem solving, mostly because many tasks are going to be supported by technology. And the most important thing here with a human being, it is to be able to do the things that a robot cannot do. The robot cannot make some things, for example, to be empathetic, to understand the context, to interpret it, and to make decisions based on context. And most of all, to have critical thinking and systemic thinking. Those are the most important things that we all have to learn. Sadly, in many universities, I have 
often seen in the curriculum or a subject that is called critical thinking for decision making. But I have found a great variety of online courses that are teaching these abilities. And those are good news. We are in a historical moment where we have more alternatives to study than ever before. And that is because of the pandemic. So I invite you to take advantage of these opportunities because we have so many online opportunities and we can have also a very complicated work scheme, but we can have some free time to learn new things and we can acquire or get and develop a new skill that can transform the future of our professional career. Leticia, what initiatives can uh, or which initiatives can a government support for this new way of working? I think that the predictive analytics is going to be more important than ever before to have or to make decisions about public policy, something that I have seen in my company that in multiple governments in all the world through the predictive analytics, they have uh, been able to understand the evolving of the industries because of the technology affecting them, how they are going, how the regional sectors or areas are going to move forward because of data, how how the impact of technology is going to affect the workforce, and that allows them to have very well informed and strategic decisions. For example, how am I going to retrain this great amount of people that I work for because uh, the automatization of the work? And with these tools, predictive analytics, we are going to do it and to find the solution in the best and fast way and to increase the employability, not only in the group of people with a university degrees or good level of education, but also people that don't have those work opportunities. And many times they are at higher risks in terms of um, their jobs to being automatized. Uh, we have to use the science of data to make decisions based on evidence and to strengthen the employability and all our region of Latin America. Leticia, I would like to thank you for this conversation, for this space and the time you've had with us. Thank you. Undoubtedly, that is a very interesting vision, Leticia. But here we want to land this, land this to the reality of our country. That's why we have invited the uh, main stakeholders of this uh, area. We have men and women here that are participating. We have to explore the challenges we have in terms of digital talent, inclusion, training. How do we start introducing this as an asset to bring investment and new businesses into our country? Here in this study, remotely, we have some people, and we have Monica Retamal, who's a director, executive director from Fundación Curá. We have Leslie Herrera, who has a bachelor's from uh, the digital talent uh, program and remotely as common in this uh, pandemic uh, factor we have Maria Inés Salamalca the coordinator of UN Women Chile and from Equifax uh, welcome everyone to this uh, remote conversation and the conversation here and the study as well in this room thank you for the invitation Thank you. The first question will be for everyone. Rankings position Chile in a good place, at least in Latin America, in terms of human capital. But it's far from leader countries in the world, like Singapore. For your different fields, what's this, the status of EPTEC and digital talent here in Chile? I believe we have a great potential that we have to take advantage of. I think Chile is positioned as a country that has known how to address the export uh, supply, but uh, main, mainly focus on products, and we have to leap towards uh, service export. And the base talent there is a key. We have the talent there. We have talent in terms of creative industries and architecture. But how do we make this talent? 
How do we disseminate our talent and for it to export its services to other places? And there, different abilities, digital abilities, for example, are key in a planet as globalized as the planet that we're in. All these skills have to do with knowledge, with the human knowledge to put value into this and bring it to the outside. This is all key and everything that we're doing in training and looking again at the export uh, supply or offer in terms of uh, training and installed capacities, well, that is key. Leslie, how do you see this? From my experience, I've realized that even with my partners, I've seen that they, there's people that have enormous potential that come from uh, careers that are not that valued in the economic field and they have a great potential as uh, Monica told you to add these digital abilities to other things they could uh, they could be an additional for example a plus for example a lawyer that could go and turn to the digital uh, side a field for example they could digitize uh, some things from notary public I see it I see this on a daily basis with um, my partners who are nurses architects lawyers there's yes there's um, many careers and we have to act as a whole and learn from everything. Maria Ines, from UN Women, how do you see this challenge? Because the world is changing and the world of labor has to change too. Yes, there have to be many changes. We have to see them because from UN Women, we're convinced that in able to attract more investment, we do need to incorporate at least half of the population in an area that is hard. We nowadays have a long road or journey ahead. For example, the difficulties that women uh, live to access the, si the world of sciences, technologies. Nowadays, more than 30%, less than 30% of the people that research in the world, their researchers are women. And there are less publications in the area of STEM, for example. They are not that well paid in areas of research and they do not advance at the same speed as men in careers. And we see this in the generation of licenses in countries such as Chile, for example. Um, region as Mexico, Brazil, where there's high uh, participation of uh, women in university careers, we don't see the reflection of the incorporation of talent and f for women to participate in the same way in the STEM careers, for example. And that, I believe, is one of the main challenges, because if we want to bring more investment, we have to incorporate that talent. What do you think about this, Gustavo? From the private world in Equifax, we had a bet 11 years ago with Equifax. We nowadays have many more companies in software development that are being implemented in Chile, deployed, because there's a productive matrix of materials to export, and there is a productive matrix from the network of universities of professionals of great quality. And nowadays, organizations such as Codea, Laboratoria, we have people that come from a motivational uh, origin more than university and this has made uh, the rate very high we see different professionals that are of great quality and there are many companies not only because of economic reasons or because of the Chilean of the stability of Chile are here because maybe the talent is there I'd like to go with Monica here in the in the room. What are the main challenges, Monica, that are faced that I identified in the current development of ed tech and in terms of digital talent in our country? I'd like to say first that the software software is eating the world. This is not a Chilean problem. It is a global problem. There's more. There's not enough human capacity nowadays to absorb the demand because of digital talent in the world and that's good news yes now we from public policies or what we have to think we have to think how we can capture part of that demand that is unsatisfied that is there in the planet and that and that logic that is very important because the countries that are able to ride the digital wave and seize this new revolution as it's happened in all the previous industrial revolutions are those people that do what they have to do in terms of labor reforms, in terms of uh, training. 
sorry, but this revolution that we lived in last nine months, uh, what happened in a decade, ha had to happen in a decade, they happened in a semester. Yes, data shows that we had data what was going to happen in 10 more years that happened this year. So, of course, there was a, a massive digitalization. But, of course, that digitalization has to go accompanied with the, dev accompanied with the development of uh, skills that are higher, not only to consume and go and digitalize, digitize what we do, but uh, to be able to add value, which is something different than um, being connected to Zoom all day. On the one hand, we have enormous demand. On the other side, we have stagnant and traditional labor trajectories. As Leslie said, the person that studies to be an attorney believes that they will die being an attorney, and that does not exist anymore in the world we have installed that we'll have to go back to restudy once and again, retrain to stay in force and to have more labor resilience. And that uh, is critical because in terms of the supply of uh, training uh, programs, it's, we don't have these careers that never end, but we have to have a good offer and supply of short trainings that allow us to stay updated, keep updated, and that is what has always happened in the technological industry. Obsolescence is so high in this industry that everyone that's worked there, we know that what happened last year doesn't exist anymore. You have to restudy and certify yourself in something new. So these famous uh, boot camps is something that is happening in the developed world. Digital talent, we've seen that this is happening in New York, in Paris, in London. Why? Because we know, and we're very well aware, the massive training of the labor force is something that is uh, fully necessary for what you're talking about, the pandemic. The pandemic has evidence that there's many people in companies that have to uh, convert themselves or you have to turn them over. When we have these uh, transaction costs, for example, when I connect with you and I don't need an intermediate, we realize uh, that uh, we have to be uh, lighter in terms of management and technology puts this into evidence. So those people that do not offer value anymore to organizations, they have to go, they have to retrain to be useful again. This has to do with Maria as well. Leslie, when could the specialization, digital specialization can have an influence? We talked about this before. And in the professional and personal life of workers today, the specialization, digital specialization, how does the picture change? Well, from my personal experience, I'm a commercial engineer as a profession, and I was able to apply those not specialist knowledge, knowledge and currently I work in, at an e-commerce and I was able to mix both knowledges to make them com compatible, specializing in coding. So it's in the end, it's something that can help you even to um, automize, uh, to have a, a global vision and to help the company grow. Oh, it's a huge tool. Exactly. Marianes, how do you see this? A special, digital specialization, how, do, how much does it help not only women, uh, workers in general? Well, I think that here, with this pandemic, this has set a huge challenge that we, we already had a crisis before that had to do with automation of the employment and that's been accelerated with this pandemic. And we had information that, that we hope that by the end of 2020, more than 7.1 million jobs will be just removed and most of the jobs will disappear by 2050. And uh, Gustavo, uh, you said this at the beginning, which are the talent, digital talents that you're looking for, that companies are looking for? What's the tal kind of talent what companies are looking for in this digital talent? Well, I would say that companies for to hire to hire they're lo looking for leaders there's a base level that's specialized that has just been trained that basically seeks to have a passion for technology and the capabilities of learning something that chilling companies don't have much but foreign companies bring a lot to this market they come here and i will train you as long as you want to learn you can de develop with us and you will have a future in general that's the base at that level at an intermediate level they are looking for highly specialized people especially today with the boom of cloud technologies 
on everything that has to do with Ma Madison, Amazon, with Microsoft, are they are expecting people in these more intermediate or higher sectors that will talent that will be able to train the new employees. Those are the things that are being looked for by companies that, and the capability of speaking or communicating in English. You can work with people throughout around the world and you need to be able to communicate basically, at least. And that because of that, those that just finish studying and people that have more experience, it's a, it becomes a must. It's not an option. Monica, in your experience, what's the total, as Gustavo, what, what's the digital talent that we companies are looking for today? Well, I think that one of them is that the most required one is the capability of developing technology. That when you go to the profile and, and ask companies, the first thing is that they need to, for him to know how to code. That's very generic. You can code in different languages, or etc. And the reconversion programs that we have leave you at the first floor of that, and you need to understand that from there, you need to start choosing flavors, and etc. And there's a lot of people, and a lot of people is needed that has to do with experience design, the front end. Of, a, of the web page. The, the users of technology know that it's very hard, different to have a software that you don't really know how to use, that you need to, you don't need to know how to press, or these experienced developers make this software flow. You would say that, okay, this is, that marks a difference, a huge difference between buying or not buying this, because front design is something that's extremely interesting and it's been very important with us in with the fraud specialties because there's a lot of need and capabilities in Chile for the design a very good design so it's like what they were saying it's an upskilling for a designer that becomes a front designer that can solve a lot of things I would say that those are the most relevant request and the next question is for the four of the four of you it has to do with how if Chile how can Chile improve this digital talent and how can this help Leslie for instance to bring greater investment to our country in how to improve digital talent and how can that bring more investment and better investment well as in this program for instance the digital talent at Codea as a laboratoria to keep driving more people to be maybe even setting the requirements a bit lower and starting from my personal opinion with younger people to help young people to learn that they are curious before they, they to, to start using technology to change things that are born in the digital area most of us are not and let me tell you something my niece that is she's 18 years old and she's from a digital area there's a lot of things that she doesn't know how to use powerpoint or word but she doesn't need that because she has a cell phone she doesn't know how to use a computer could you believe that i mean from our mindset that you have to learn both worlds. Young people don't necessarily know this, and for, they need to learn, as I, they were saying before, to learn how to learn, to motivate them to learn by themselves. There's a lot of information that you can auto-train, cheap training courses, and to wake up this learning, this that they notice, that they realize that you have knowledge and in your hand literally and the possibility of change your changing yourself and change the country same question for our remote contacts Maria Inez and Gustavo how can Chile attract or improve this digital talent and how can that help that investment grow and are better in our country Maria Inez I think that it's basic to have national policies for science and technology that have a high impact with a long-term view. I think that having national strategies for, for the long term from the ministries of technology and science, we had a dialogue with the ministers of science and technology from Colombia, Argentina, Chile also. And one of the main goals in these national plans of technology that also are incorporate more and more the importance of reducing gaps in the sense of being able to involve women and young girls in STEM careers, women in 
from certain groups are more discriminated, they would talk about racial components because if we double click in the axis of technology, obviously today we have a lot of challenges of digital gaps in Latin America that we need to strengthen. And if we, I think if we have policies with a view of coordination with other ministries to strengthen institutions, it's fundamental to create national policies that allow us to think about this 2050 to attract that talent, to create it with a view of linked to education, research, innovation. We think that it's basic. And another important point is that from the employers, from companies, to retain the talent. And that talent also, apart from retaining it, to enable it to create those capabilities and the necessary skills for that 50% of jobs that we don't know yet. Gustavo. Actually, I... Maria said something that's very important. Even if the national policies will be very important, I think that private world, the ones that are part of the market today, we have a component that we need to bring back. New generations that we are hiring now expect to be able to contribute to society what society has contributed to themselves given the, the training. You are hiring people not only to come here and develop, they want to do something more. That's where we, as a private world, we need to you have the duty to go to university and cooperate with organizations like Odea, Laboratoria, and other organizations to train that capital that we have. It has to be a, a joint venture between both of us. The base of uh, IT professionals that are trained today has a great quality. And another thing important, Chile should be able to generate a policy for training, but for that professional that already has or is already older in the market, between 40 and 50 years old, IT, the, the useful life is very short, and we need to change that. We need to be able to train in new technologies to that age group, because that age group today, maybe they're not part of the new technologies, but they have a lot of experience that we can absorb. And if we have a program to include that level, will help us a lot. This, Gustavo, with you, I would like to go from the public role to the role of private companies. What's the role, the contribution of private companies for the development of this digital talent? We have a, a, some sort of a diagnosis from the public side. But now from the private, from the private side, I think that many companies today that, that cooperate with Invest Chile know that the number of companies that are looking for creating development centers in Chile is very important. So there's a clear signal from the private world to show the state that even if Chile is a good copper export, is very good in exporting copper. Part of the pr productive matrix of Chile should be software development. We have a huge opportunity. The minds of people don't have a limit. So the pri private work is believing in Chile, which is more than Chile is believing in itself from the digital perspective. I think that today there's companies that are starting that have new ways of interacting with employees that are different from what we are used to. Not only hiring experienced, experienced people, but producing and creating the talents that they need, and they are generating an entry of value, a generation of value that goes beyond exporting raw materials. That's a contribution from our, our side as a private world that the state should be more involved or noticing that in that market moves in that direction. I qualify this personal experience in this field that program. It was a, a, a 180 degree change. Everything changed in my life. I think that I'm very extremely happy with the experience that I lived. It's very intense. You have to study a lot. As Monica says, there are very short programs where you need to learn a lot in very short term uh, time. But I came from a very traditional industry where I had to use uniforms and to get there a certain time very structured as a school, yes, and from the school to another school. And, well, to change to this world, that's everything is fast, you're learning things every day, it's very dynamic. 
personally fills me up. I think that uh, to focus from the wi from women point of view, uh, you need to know that you have this possibility. You can start working on these programs, and it's very satisfying to change, to know that it doesn't matter how old you are, because I don't have a, an IT title. They, were, they hired me just looking at my skills and what I learned. So to know, to notice, oh, wait, I don't need a title. Is this, could this be real? Well, I will try this because, so, I don't have a work now, I don't have a job. I will try to study and, and it worked and it's real. And I'm very happy now. I will take this conversation to digital talent evolution in our country in the next decade. How do you see this? Could this become an, a more competitive asset to attract investment in Chile? Hopefully. At least every day I wake up uh, every morning really and think it should be like that, should work out like that. I think that everyone that is in positions where we can decide, we have to fight that battle because countries and revolutions like this, they have gaps of opportunities. They have to know how to capitalize them. There's countries and history shows this, that they're able to visualize the opportunities and make the policies and all the forces and the energies go towards that direction. I think that we all have to be capable of, we're, we're starting to dream again, we're starting to connect with the needs of the country, so we all have to seize, take advantage of this moment, not only to look at the past, but to project Chile in the 21st century and this issue, which is human capital, what are, who are people will be, what's the value that Chileans will contribute to humanity, this is critical. And that's why I believe we need to do this. We, I think that digital talent and the public policies that we're implementing, they're a great uh, hope for them, but uh, we do need a lot of support. We need companies to also believe in this human capital. Because, of course, in Chile, they still ask you in your resume what you studied, where you studied, and, of course, there has to be a change there. We have to be open for there to be more diverse talent in organizations, and therefore we are the ones that have to do this change, make this change of mindset. But the truth is that the possibility is there, the talent is there. Chile, throughout the whole country, has uh, enormous talent. So we have to see how we'll... Uh, be part of this revolution. So, Gustavo, how, how do you see the projection towards this next decade? I think it has to do a bit more... I'm thinking about how it has to happen, really. Nowadays, Chile, at a global level, it is uh, standing well standard. I have said this before, and I'll reinforce. If uh, countries like Equifax, they're with $4 million, and they are in the center of Santiago versus Ireland, where they have benefits its fiscal benefits versus the U.S. versus any other country at a global level. This is all linked to the fact that the productive capacity that we currently have versus the cost, they have very good, uh, great radios. In Equifax, when we go and we do the debates, uh, the cost-benefit for the company is better in Chile than in India. Countries that were historically cheaper, that's why it was done there. So it's not if it's going to happen or not, it's uh, how it's going to happen. So from the private world, from organizations such as Laboratoria, Codea, that are working to digitalize, that's how we'll work here. I think that in these types of instances where we're, there's different areas of the market collaborating, we will generate connections that will make us continue working. So that is very important both for me and for us as a company, that the private world is not isolated from the state government world and organizations. We need to all work together because at the end of the day, we are just one unique country, one society, and we have to work on that, based on that. Maria Ines, your turn. I do agree, because in Latin America, we are in a moment that is proper for countries to do many things. One is planning pursuant to this context and this productive economic context future 
and this revolution is ongoing it starts to shape and I think there has to be more coordination between the institutions, different organizations, including organizations of uh, civil society, organizations that are working in digital literacy, the creation of uh, capacities, development of talent. And an important point that we need has to do with investment training programs that do adjust to the demands that exists now and in this vision from now to 2050 that will require fun funding and I think that that funding is not public investment but it's also private we have to boost that uh, look the perspective which is intersectorial work that accompanies the identification of the skills that we're currently needing it's great for you to motivate everyone that is looking at this space that is observing now for you to recommend workers to make these take this initiative of taking their digital talent to be a bit more competitive in the world would you recommend this uh, Leslie yes fully and I'm going to say that you do not have to be afraid not to have a professional title or a bachelor's degree because there are some works that, that need more mathematical work, etc. But not all works need this degree. They, they, was, they were talking about user experience. There's many things you can do and that you come with that information that you can apply your knowledge, you can mix your knowledge, you can continue studying and opt to better labor opportunities. So I would recommend, even if you do not enter a program, you start you can start looking at your learning path. It is, and you, you have YouTube. There's many uh, very cheap courses on the internet. Even if you do not enter a program such as this one, I do recommend to go into the world of programming for a uh, personal satisfaction. Knowledge is being duplicated a y once a year at least. So if we are concerned about staying updated, updated, it's uh, our thing. So learning is something that is here to stay. So we're all called to come back and study, to study constantly in an ongoing manner. Nowadays, there are many alternatives to study again, which are free, paid, uh, abroad, here. So there's no excuse not to do so. And I believe that there's something that is key here. Not only is this related to work, but I think that on 2027, this is already happening. It's more than 50% of the labor force. It's increasing. And the world of independent or autonomous uh, individuals is people that will have to generate a, a differentiated uh, offer or supply of value and differentiate itself and cooperate with the different companies but because companies will do uh, will have to adapt to another to a force that it's a little bit more liquid so it's key it's very important to uh, focus on personal training maria ines i think we also have to focus on besides the importance of really uh, developing this new talent a new point I'd like to highlight is that those workers that are currently incorporating, they are developing, they are developing these new skills. We need to give them visibility, make them visible. We talked about role models here, and I think that in a policy of strengthening the de uh, development of skills, we do have to show role models, good examples that are showing you what Monica is just mentioned the professional development, individual skills for them to have personal ventures that need individual responsibility on the one hand, but to call the private sector and the employer sector to uh, draft a roadmap for digital transformation and for that to include gender perspective, I think it's very important not to leave half of the population outside of this transformation. We need to retrain and elevate or increase the competences of women here. 
and we also need to promote the hiring of uh, or recruitment of women in the sector and we need to talk about the importance of uh, intersectorial partnerships. Gustavo, what is your recommendation? First of all, I couldn't agree more with what they just mentioned. We need to migrate from saying, okay, we do not discriminate by gender to truly drive or push towards the direction that we do not want to insert gender equity, that we want to insert gender equity within our company. We have to work actively for this. I am from the IT world. I have worked in the company, the same company for 11 years. And I believe that everything that has to do with digitalization, the development of software, gives you tremendous uh, potential. You have career, you have development, very, very high probabilities. I remember a couple of years ago we talked about informatic engineer would not be more than one week without job be uh, job because they would find another one right away because th there is a gigantic need so we need to recommend this it is mental work that needs much thinking thinking it is quite active you feel that what you're doing every day is uh, many labyrinths and games more than simply uh, just a job it's hard to give the first step but once you do that you uh, do not feel afraid anymore you lose fear and you can continue on this path a great path that anyone can uh, do. Monica Artamal, Marina Salamalca here in the studio, and Gustavo Rivera through a remote uh, meeting, which is pretty normal. We'd like to thank you for your time, for your space, for going deep into this very, very important issue. Let's continue here with the seminar, and please pay attention to, attention to the following information. Thank you, Andres. I'd like to comment that Investile speaks the language of investors. The agency has a team of professionals able to attend your needs of foreign companies such in Spanish, English, Chinese, uh, French, German, in a free manner. To know a bit more about Investire, I'd like to invite you to watch the following video. In a context where demand for food has been sustained, where also the population grows every day but resources grow shorter and shorter, are the food producers the ones that have been challenged to face this reality. We have to implement technology and innovation, and this is done using plants. The ingredients that we consume to increase the productivity of these entrepreneurships. And in this area, we're talking about food, food tech, where we talk about improving and adding innovation and technology to agricultural processes. We talk about agrotech, because Chile is a niche for the development of these entrepreneurships. Because $400 million have been invo invested in these areas, we will talk about this with our special guests that are here with us in the studio. First of all, we have Priyanka Trinivas, which is the founder of a Chilean Indian company, the Live Green Company, with using AI, manufacture 100% vegetable food 
sabrosos, sanos, with, with a lot of flavor, healthy Además, and sustainable with environment. Also, we have over Zoom, Andrea Ramos, country manager of the Andertinian company, Kilimo, and that uses big data to optimize the risk management in agriculture. And also, we have Eduardo Zavala, the CEO and founder of Trump properly remarked as a uma, Chilean umami while development, developing this intensifier of flavor in a natural way using the fermentation of fungus, fun, fungi. And Alvaro Salas, co-founder of Proteira, specialist in functional protein development that fight fungi on certain foods as bread and improve their texture and flavor. How are you, all of you, those that are joining us in the studio and Adria Ramos online, thank you very much for participating. And we have some questions. I would like to start Start asking Tria, Priyanka. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Why did you decide to create a um, food tech venture? Sure. So before I started the Livreen company, I was working for this big US company called Target, where I was the senior manager for the grocery business. And what I used to do with my team is that every product that went in 2,000 stores in the United States used to be decided by me and my team. And during that time, I realized that on shelf, when we look at packaged food, there was not really an option of clean labels. And also, food was also, anything healthy was always considered expensive. And that is where it, I saw there was a huge need of starting Live Green Co., where we are using technology to make food 100% natural, without any processed ingredients, as well as affordable. So we've started with three product lines, which is called the burger mixes, the pancake mixes, and an immunity booster. And very, very soon, next month, we will be launching the world's cleanest ice cream label in Chile. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Andrea, about agrotech, you have a very, very important role and innovation in technology is fundamental for developing a task that's been traditional, but today starts being on the cutting edge. What motivated you to start this entrepreneurship in agrotech? Well, thank you very much for the invitation. In our case, the truth is that we being able to create a company that had an, an exponential impact that was able to generate a change in the world and leave its footprint. The founders had another company before that related to the agrotech world and they were able to identify different challenges and they noticed that irrigation was at a regional level producers don't manage to solve especially if we consider the challenges that we are going through today and are facing today. So in that sense, if you want to have an impact in the world and transform certain practices, agro presents huge opportunities on one side because of what you were talking about, the greater produ production of food for the number of population that we need to feed. And on the other side, on the other hand, in our regional economy has a fundamental role uh, in terms of the uh, exports and the third part the most important part for us is agriculture uses 70 percent of sweet drinking water at a global level and in these developing countries as uh, ours this reaches up to 90 percent so that's what motivated us to create Kirimo. sorry can you describe us why did you choose chile to to make this a business or a venture? Sure. I think that's the first question I am mostly asked, the first or second question as to why is an Indian in Chile? So I'm 100% happy to answer that for you. So Chile for me was, is a small country. Uh, it is an extreme, it behaves very similar to United States when you look at retail. So I was working with Target, which was in the States, but I was looking to start a company on my own. And if you start in a big country like India or United States or anywhere, you really don't understand whether you're, you've reached product market fit quickly. But Chile, because it's small, it was very important that we test, learn, iterate. Mm. And then once we are sure of our product market fit, we go global. So that is one reason where Chile fit the whole 
idea of starting in Chile. Second thing, Chile also has free trade agreements with over 60 countries globally, mm -hmm. which means that we can start and go global where 1.4 billion people market is opened up via Chile. So it was a perfect combination for a startup like ours. And that is why we came here. A perfect combination. What do you think about this, Andrea? Because you expand in Chile, you start this, you choose this space that's been very bitten. We've talked about this with other guests during the seminar, but Chile is a scenario for expansion for you. Why? Exactly. First of all, Chile, in Chile we found the capital to repeat our technology. And we were working in Argentina with practically monitoring of 20% of the cultivated area under irrigation, but in extensive cultivation, uh, corn, and we knew that for global growth, we needed to deepen our growth in high added value plantations where Chile has a very interesting market. That's why we gathered the capital to open uh, operations here, and it is also very attractive, the hub and the entrepreneur mindset that's been happening for some time because of the huge effort from Corfo and other institutions that allow entrepreneurs to start and it's very tempting to be here and start their companies and also we also we always saw Chile as the market that would allow us to expand throughout the and and then and the region if we manage to develop our technology and cause a, a commercial traction in Chile in a very organic manner we would be able to reach Peru Mexico and Colombia and we started living this this year especially with Peru where there's a lot of Chilean capital we've been doing very well especially in the, even if we are in the middle of a pandemic growing digitally for agro wouldn't have been possible before. It's incredible how this situation has caused the developing new skills, new capabilities, and things that, what you said, that weren't very related, but today are necessary. It's the starting point, isn't it? Exactly, yes. The truth is that, in that sense, the pandemic has helped us and strengthened some, some practices to for startups and technology companies that will be very important to get the most of them. I will ask Leonardo here in this about this, what Andrea is saying has to do with strengths. From your point of view, thinking about the future, the investment from abroad, there's a lot of investment in these areas, but from your opinion, what's which are the strengths of Chile that could somehow contribute or make bets in these areas. Well, I completely agree with the strengths that have been mentioned. I think that now we are seeing how investment, specifically in food tech, is increasing a lot. And I think that a lot of and many lines gathered that generated this ecosystem in Chile. But the greatest strength comes from the human resources that we have in Chile. There's there's scientists that are acknowledged at an international level. So I think that there was an investment from public policies to encourage scientists to go and study in the top 50 international universities, and then they come back to Chile, and we have that capital here. That was the, the growing conditions to get these startups that are based on science. And Eduardo, do you agree with this important topic, differentiating topic that is said here, the human capital? What What is it for you to generate this learn or entrepreneurs in these areas? I, well, I completely agree. Public policies that have been implemented in the implementation of new human capital have been going on for at least 10 to 15 years, so there's a lot of improvement there. And I think that what's increased in the last few years has to do with a change in the mindset where a lot of these researchers were researching for years, and now let's do something with our research and let's take it to, to apply it topics and the eagerness to eat the world, not only looking at Chile, but looking beyond Chile and using Chile as a hub to export this, is a combination that's been happening very well and exploded the last few years. Do you agree with, um, with this or what do you think about this topic? I think I agree with 
what Leonardo and Eduardo had said. Yeah. It's easy for, for you or for your kind of company to do this business or venture in Chile? So for us, I think for us, what has been easy is to expand from Chile has been easy. For example, next month we would be starting to sell in Peru and also in the United States. So in around six to eight weeks, we were able to enter two new markets. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely pros, but there are also some things that need improvement in terms of say capital or the other services or taxation, so on and so forth. But definitely there is a pro and a con to everything. Well, I would like to know your view or your idea, Eduardo, about Chile is at the cutting edge of technology in the industry of agrotech and food tech. Do you agree or do we need mm, something else or we've been doing this for some time? How do you see this? Are we in the cutting edge? Well, yes, we are. I, I think that as a co-founder of this company, for many years, Chileans understood where we had to move forward to. And the last 30 years, the goal was very clear, but now we are a bit confused, especially what's happening with what's happening in the social topic. A great opportunity that Chile has is not only reaching victory, everything that's based on 5G. Chile was, will be one of the first to implement 5G, but we weren't the creators. In food tech, we have an opportunity of creating those 5Gs and from there reach the world. So we have a strong ecosystem, we have a natural laboratory throughout the country and with that not only chanting victory but creating those victories and about that Andrea do you think that Chile is, is in the front or the cutting edge of this technology and food tech and agrotech I think they're doing a very good job as I said before at a consumer level they present the ideal characteristics today Chile is a first line player in the most expensive growth growings of the world. There's a lot of public policies that allow agricultures to receive innovation and technology in their fields. And also, it's very important, it represents huge environmental challenges. So that pack makes the, the conditions available. And about human resources, we need to talk about this. I agree, there's a great work, but I think that a lot of technical talent today, we are competing with the United States on how to retain it. And I think there we have an important challenge that we need to see how to solve. Because in that sense, I think that we are not at the forefront of this, but we can get there. And about this, you're, we already talked about this, but we, I would like to go into detail. Why is it so indispensable to mix technology, innovation in these two areas? What's the point that marks this breaking point that, let's just say, we can't keep doing things the same way? Would you like my answer? Okay. That's yes, for you. And then the rest of the panel. Okay, there's a lot of reasons. I would like to take two of, to start. The first thing that we were talking about before, growth of popu global population and food demand, but need to produce with lower resources. There's a gap here that technology has as a tool to solve. That's why we have technology for, to solve challenges, human challenges. So in that sense, it will be fundamental, basic, and in the second place, it will solve, help to solve this demand from consumers to create more sustainable products and more fr environmentally friendly products. And data science lets us measure in a better way the way that we are producing. That's why from the analysis of that data, we can deliver to the con consumer more information. In that sense, we are developing a certification in uh, hydro fingerprint so that the consumer can know what's the impact of their productive chain of their food. And without technology, that uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible. It would take a long or hundreds of years. What, what do you think about what we are talking about, this, that innovation and technology are becoming a key piece. How do you see that? 
First of all, regarding what you talked about before, if Chile was state-of-the-art or not, I wanted to um, touch on that. It's evident that there are some startups, like the ones present today, of a technology that is unique in the world. As Eduardo well mentioned, we can now create those 5Gs. And in food, in the food industry, we have that opportunity. There's many companies that in the beginning it was hard to show that they could do that from Chile because sometimes uh, we don't believe in ourselves and they're attracting more foreign investment. There's much investment of the leader venture capitals and the globally they come here to invest in Chile and Latin America because this technology is starting to show up. So I fully agree with that. And in terms of innovation in the food industry, I believe it's uh, critical because we've mentioned this a lot. It's going to be 10 billion people in 2050 and we have the responsibility of, on the one hand, uh, supplying food for everyone, but for all of this to be sustainable because there is an environmental challenge that is significant. So we have to change the traditional manufacturing that we had. We have to extract the animals from the food chain. We have to generate uh, elements or food that are not chemicals because they do have an impact on human health. That is an enormous challenge. And from my point of view, I'm an uh, engineer on biotechnology of cows. So I uh, think that they have all these uh, tools to really uh, see these uh, challenges to address them. We have the human capital, we have technology, we are willing to do so, but let's talk about visibility. When we say that Chile is a good scenario for these types of ventures, what does Chile offer, for example? If you could tell us a bit. How has been the visibility that Chile has given to your venture? So I think, I would say this may not be a popular answer, but um, Chile has given us exposure or visibility only when we were recognized by foreign press or we got some someone in the world talking mm. about us and then we actually had people reach out to us saying oh una startup mm. chilena <laughs> like how and and unfortunately that's imp that has been the mm. case but it is improving so it is improving with time but i think there is a lot of scope in that area where the local startups, like there are programs like Startup Chile, there is a lot of government support from Corfo, but it would be great if recognition came inbound mm. than someone else recognizing and then you are getting recognized. Yes, um, I think it, this has always happened in Chile. Not only does it happen in entrepreneurship or in agrotech. In fact, Andrea is laughing because it's true. It's as if we were unfortunate with our own products. How do you see this? I think it is true. We do not have to discuss if it's true or not. It is true. But the point is that we startups, not only do we deal with the challenge that we want to solve, but we also have to deal with how our company impacts. I believe that just like the KPIs of success, not only do you see if this is sold with million dollars or not, or many countries buy with their products or not, but it has to do with how we change that ecosystem. And in terms of talent, raw material, etc., I think we have to add the sense of urgency because this window of opportunities that food tech and ag tech has, it's not going to be open forever. And not only does it have to do with ecosystem, but if our company were born in the U.S., the impact would have been larger. So we have to deal with that too. Visibility from here, at least from my company, I can start validating that I do generate an attraction that generates uh, impact in many uh, parts of the world, and that's an impact for the country. I'd like to comment that we're in this virtuous circle in which investors did not support Chilean companies because there weren't any Chilean companies that generated global impact. So we were in that virtuous circle for many years until that circle was broken. Some companies that do have their own technologies, that do have their own intellectual property started showing up and they're unique in the world. And investors uh, were left behind, just like Chilean investors. Invest 
investors from abroad, they came here, they started validating the international impact, and then Chilean investors continue and many more start appearing. So we are in that process where the Chilean ecosystem will have a global impact. Sometimes I do have to talk with food companies that are multinational, vice presidents that are in Europe and when we're talking then you mention oh yeah you come from Chile yes so we do know these other companies it's quite enriching to have that and to know that there are other companies in the food sector that are being well known globally on that subject how would you describe your experience with the funding um, issue because is, is it feasible to get foreign capitals being in, in Chile first with you and then Priya Yes, um, our experience was, well, I believe Corfo has done a great job in being the catalyzer of these companies, but without, because without Corfo we would not be here. But um, it's not that much capital in the end, because biotechnology needs laboratories. We do have an artificial intelligence uh, component. Human capital is hard. So we couldn't do it from Chile, and we didn't have any Chilean investors. So we had the opportunity of going to San Francisco. We received uh, funding from IndieBio, which is the globally known. And we were able to capture that interest, and after that we received investment from venture capitals that are in the top 25 globally from France. And that's my experience. So it is possible. And now there are other companies that are receiving investments from outside, so I think it's uh, feasible. Priyanka? Priyanka? So um, my experience, uh, if I have to talk about capital investment and VC venture capital in Chile, I would say, I would start off by saying, for me, I am a woman, so I'm a female, I'm a first time founder, I'm a foreigner. So I would not say mm -hmm. I, it is because of my hard work, because I've seen a lot of women in the ecosystem who work hard. So I would say I think I'm one of the few who's lucky because I was able to raise VC capital from Chile and definitely the foreign investors as well. And if you look at the VC investment into women globally, unfortunately only 2% is invested in women. And women of color like me, like me as an Asian or a Latina mm. or an African and all of like the people with color and diversity, it's less than one. Mm. So the statistics is very, very poor and that's why I would say I'm lucky and I would not really say it is hard work because I think the investment like Leonardo was saying that Chile with Corfo creates a lot of catalyst. You, you catalyze and you start the startup, but when you grow, you need the money. And you cannot grow to a global billion dollar business without investment. And that risk capital in Chile is traditional and it is slow. Mm. So even if I want to stay in Chile, and I want to grow from here globally, it will become very difficult at the speed at which we are growing because startups don't work like traditional companies. They grow very fast. Mm. So is the ecosystem ready for a unicorn? Is the ecosystem ready for a made in Chile startup? I'm not sure. Mm. So I would say, unfortunately, if things change in that direction, then the fire that we have through public funds will actually create global entities from Chile. What Priyanka is mentioning is very important because it questions what we're generating, the ingraining, understanding all these processes that must go together and that there are some outstanding debts. And we could say that this is a stick in the wheel. You try, you try to move forward and it's very hard. What is your vision regarding funding, attracting foreign investment, foreign capital being in Chile? I think it is hard, but it is uh, becoming less hard, at least in this sector. We have the great reference that is NOTCO that has started to open uh, doors and flattening what the other companies have been doing from behind. So there's a virtuous circle there of putting that stick in the wheel, like you mentioned, by... Uh, 
It's, it's be, we're breaking it. My experience with private funding in Chile, it, uh, we, uh, it was uh, six months work and we just closed with international funding from Mexico and in Switzerland, it was just three weeks. So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but for Chilean individuals, it's like, oh, okay, why am I, uh, why is it taking me six months? And this next time it doesn't have to be like that. So it's an ecosystem that starts improving because at the end of the day, it doesn't have to do with purchasing the best companies at a cheap price, but it's not missing out on the opportunities. Regardless of that, I'd like to ask Andrea, Chile, regardless of everything we've mentioned, which are some details that we have left, such as uh, pending or out and task, but Chile, has Chile acted as a platform to expand its uh, businesses or your business uh, within the region? What do you think? In our case, yes. And it had and it allowed us to validate this thesis that it was going to be the bridge that would allow us to es escalate to the Indian region. And in terms of agrotechnology, as I commented, the relationship that has been created between Chile and Peru in, in agro terms, agricultural terms, it's uh, very close. There's much capital that is entering there because of the drought of Chile. And Chile has a challenge there. How is it not left behind? Because this, the truth is that the numbers that Peru is showing in the last years, the truth is is they are very significant, considerable, and there has been some uh, great progress, but that it has allowed us to reach there and reach Mexico in the midst of the pandemic, and it has allowed us, allowed us to escalate our relationships with the customers. For example, if we close uh, businesses here with corporations whose headquarters are in Chile, that allows us to rapidly start monitoring the fields in Peru and Mexico in a quite organic manner. So, in that regard, it's been a great driver for us. Andrea, I'd like to ask you, because we've mentioned how much uh, Chile has in terms of growth, uh, how much it has left, but from your point of view, what should be the focus? of solid work in terms of driving the growth of these areas. It's very aligned with what we talked about before. Capital is critical. Chile has improved much in the initial stages and stages of consolidation. But when we want to generate a great expansion, I think that all entrepreneurs start looking at the north, northern areas. And I hope that is something we can change at a medium term. There are many family offices in Chile which do not even understand what a startup is. They don't understand what a convertible note is, but different concepts that we manage and we need for raising capital. So I think that is a penny, that, that, that's a debt we had. That will, st it'll start being, we'll start driving it once an investor comes from the outside and then we generate a startup and that will update our uh, knowledge. Leonardo, from your point of view, where should the focus be to uh, drive growth in these areas? I think there should be three main focuses. One is investment in technology. That is critical. I think there has to be some um, investment there because it's a wave I think we uh, caught in the perfect timing. And uh, we can reap benefits for that. We don't have to bring it technology from that, so we have to develop it here. The other one is the focus on high-level uh, products. For example, what we do is we produce ingredients based on protein. The production is with, is with bio, bio reagents uh, that do not exist here. And Argentina and Brazil has them, but Chile does not have them. So we have these agents and uh, we have uh, research and development here in Chile, but manufacturing is uh, there in Europe. We should, it doesn't make any sense. We should have that infrastructure. And the last thing is that Chile has to be state-of-the-art, update itself in terms of renewable, the status of uh, products. Chile is very well known internationally for its uh, food regulation policies. It's very well known. This issue of the seals is uh, known internationally in Latin America. We are referent in terms of ingredients. So, ingredients. so we do have that advantage assembled. We should now have uh, clear policies to regulate these new ingredients. It's uh, products that do not exist, did not exist before. They're new. So we have to go to the FDA, to the US, or do we have to go to other entities? Chile could posi position itself well there to say, 
say, okay, I'm going to be uh, uh, an example in Latin America. We'll have a clear process. And I think that's the three areas where strategy. Pre, how do you see Actec and Foodtech in five years more? Actec and Foodtech in five years more, I see that there would be a lot of food technology companies globally because one, it's the need of the hour with a lot of population, 10 million mouths to feed. There should be disruptive startups to solve that problem. Sustainability and health are the biggest issues of our time. Health, unfortunately, like we all know, COVID is our new reality. So health and sustainability are going hand in hand. And that is where food tech and ag tech are the industries that we need to disrupt. If we need to solve these two problems, we need to disrupt these industries. And I believe that from Latin America and Chile, we would definitely see great solutions uh, and uh, helping uh, solve the bigger problem in the world. And how do you see your own businesses, Eduardo, Leonardo, Andrea? How do you see uh, your businesses from now to five, in five more years? Is there fertile land? Yes, I think that we were driving these companies is because there is much space and it is global space, at least in my company. I see we can position the ingredients that we developed and for them to become a new reality. There's this challenge of feeding everyone, but uh, we're convinced we're, we can't uh, feed them as we feed them today. So there has to be a technology component there. And we need to turn into this famous quote that says that developed countries do not do research and development because it's their hobbies. It's a reason why they're developed countries. I believe that under that concept, the startups, we have much to say. And I hope uh, we're a significant player in that transformation. Leonardo, how do you see your business in five more years? The vision we have is to deliver these new ingredients to replace chemical products that we know are harmful for human health, trans fats, etc., antibiotics that generate bacterial resistance, which will be our next challenge. We will not have any more antibiotics and we'll have to develop more products. So that is our core vision through proteins. Proteins are functional, as we know. We've shown that they are better than other chemical products that already exist in the market. That's from the technological point of view and the challenge we want to solve, but it is very important for these ingredients to reach everyone, not only a segment of society that is able to pay more for a premium product that will have healthy ingredients and for the rest to continue eating chemicals. That is the vision we have for these products to be scalable to a price that makes them feasible, or that reaches everyone. Yes, undoubtedly, this is a sector where our country continues progressing. It is uh, marking trends, and it will surely continue working. To Andrea, to Priyanka, to Eduardo, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. And Andres has an interesting uh, person to interview now if we talk about continuing growth. Now we continue. We're ready to talk with, we can see it on the screen, at least on the studio, with Enrique Martinez, General Manager in Chile of the Mexico group Bimbo, one of the most important companies in the food industry in our country that has interesting expansion and in investment projects. Enrique, welcome to the seminar. Good morning. Good morning, Andres. Thank you very much for this moment. First of all, what motivated to you to increase your productive capacity in Chile? What motivated in this complicated moment in the world in Chile? Well, Andres, uh, uh, just a, a bit of history. Our history of the Bimbo Group in Chile started in 1992 with the acquisition of Ideal, a brand that's very important in the national market, that throughout time, and this time, we've been adding products from our portfolio, international portfolio of brands, and we've been improving in a very important way. Luckily, and because especially because of this strong demand in the last few years, especially in this last two years, we've had the need, a, a, a glad need of executing two initiatives. The first one, the creation of a distribution center that would be inaugurated next year, and the third 
productive plant, the first one outside of Santiago in the region of Nuble in the middle of 2022. Why Chian, Enrique? It's very important. You said Nuble, one of the newest in our country. It was part of a Bio Bio region, but why do you choose Chian specifically? Well, it's not, it's not it's not something new. Chile is one of the longest countries in the world, and it presents huge challenges in logistics. And with that, the southern part of the country has had an important growth for us in the last few years. And the location of Chillán covers strategically an answer, a response to the, in these two senses. We want to join the growth of a region from Chijan and also to transport and contribute the economical reactivation of Nuble. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. To thank Invest Chile, I would like to take this moment to thank Invest Chile for their support because of them we've been able to build relationships with professionals and the authorities that have received this project with open arms. It's very important, Enrique, in moments of economical difficulties that people maybe want to know when this plant could be ready, how many job positions you will create, because it will have a positive impact in this area. Yes, we are very glad. It's one of the pro most important projects, I would say, of the group for this next years. And we are considering a 12-month construction period once we start the, the work after all the permits. And the most important thing is, I want to say this, because from the construction itself will be causing a demand of local labor force for the construction and once we start operations in the initial stage we will have 90 90 people and in the mid to long term we will have up to 180 direct contracts and that means that we will have all the job positions and uh, indirect positions that will cause and Enrique, how challenging has been this pandemic for you, for the business, for the food business? Well, it's been very challenging, as I, I think that for everyone. And we faced it based on, on our purpose for the business, our beliefs and values in innovation and in sustainability. Around these values, we've faced the pandemic using ad adapting ourselves very quickly to the changes in demand of our consumers and customers. And we've had to make changes in our internal protocols for manufacturing, for distribution, and for customer support. And of course, the most important thing is that we've ensured that our collaborators in their working areas have the hygiene and sanitization measures to reduce or minimize the contagion level. And luckily, we've accomplished this along with we've managed to have continuity in the business. And today, I can say that thanks to them that we acknowledge every day, Chile was able to have fresh bread every day in their homes. Thank you very much for this conversation, Enrique, and we will be aware, very aware of the expansion plans. Thank you very much.
And with this, we have reached the end of this e-seminar Chile, redriving investment and new business opportunities organized by Invest Chile, the foreign investment promotion agency. We hope that this conversation has been useful for you to have an idea on the opportunities and challenges that our country is facing in a changing economic environment that marks the development of Chile in the following years. We would like to invite you to stay connected through the webpage investchile.gov.cl to stay aware of the future activities of the agency and the main news about foreign investment in Chile. Thank you very much for participating with us. Good morning. We are Chile. For us, each day is an adventure. The adventure of learning, the adventure of growing, of harnessing new talent. We are a young country, but one that has come a long way. It has not always been easy. Our character has been forged by challenges, and we're proud of what we have built together. You know us. You know what we're talking about. We're talking about confidence and the future we're building today. We're talking about strength, transparency, and a country with a vision of international integration with you as a partner, an ideal partnership for your project to thrive with talent, with creativity, with leadership. We are Chile, the platform in Latin America for global business. Let us make your next project happen.